Okay. And so Molly, I'm gonna let you introduce yourself, um, the what things you wanna share with us, and then um, we'll get started. It's gonna be a little bit different today. Molly um, has an artistic talent that I didn't know anything about and was in our Faces of Aces Thriving Lives art exhibit recently. So she's gonna be sharing something that she did with us um, through that in a PowerPoint. And I'm really looking forward to it. So Molly, I'll let you introduce yourself and just kick it off and I'll jump in as questions come up and I'll watch the chat for you as well. Okay, let me, should I go ahead and share my screen? It's not at the bottom. Is it not? Oh, wait, it's like flashing, hold on, okay. Sometimes you have to hover over it to make it come up. Okay. Can y'all see that? <laughs> Can y'all see that? It's coming up. Okay, cool. All right, so do you want me to start or just introduce myself, Denise? You walk me through yeah, this. If you don't, <laughs> yeah, if you don't mind to introduce yourself and whatever you wanna share with us about your roles in the community. Okay. And then, um, then we'll go from there. And let's see, Candace, I can't see your face, but I'm in an apartment complex with, I guess, a thousand people sharing internet and mine's been freezing a couple of times. So if something happens to me, I apologize in advance. And if Candace can take over, if I happen to <laughs> disappear permanently. So Molly, I apologize ahead of time if I, something happens, but I just realized our internet's not very stable here. You're fine. Okay, so, um... My name is Molly Furman. Um, in my professional roles, I'm the program coordinator for the Watauga LEAD program and the Recovery on the Inside, which is the jail um, program. Uh, I have a social work background and work with uh, Marissa and Ashley and McKenzie at the, uh, and Valerie at the Mediation and Restorative Justice Center in Boone. Um, I'll get into quite a bit of my story here, but I'm a Watauga County native. I was born here. Um, my partner and I, we have six children between the two of us. We're a blended family um, and we live out in Bethel. Are you there, Denise? Yes, I'm here. I was, let's see, I'm only seeing black on the screen share. Mary, I can see your face, Mary McKinney. Can you, are you seeing the actual slides? I do see them, yes. Okay, I'm not, but I, I've seen them before. So Molly, don't worry about me. As long as everybody else can see them, then we're good. So um, thank you for that introduction. What we wanna talk about today is um, some of Molly's story that she wants to share with us and um, some of the people in advance that um, helped you create a thriving life mm -hmm. and then some of the ways that you stay well. So I'm going to let you start with um, parts of your story that you'd like to share. Okay. Um, I want to preface this with that this was not the way that I intended this to be shared. Um, Denise had asked if I would do the series and then I said, yes, I always try to say yes. I'm blessed that my life has been, um, or today is a life of service. And I try to always say yes and show up when I'm asked to, um, to share part of myself, whether that be personally or professionally. And I agreed to do this session. And then we did the, or had the opportunity to do um, the art exhibit and they kind of coincided. And I had wanted to draw out like some parts of my story um, for a long time, but never really had a reason to do it. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm going to paint this thing on a big, like scroll of paper and record the whole thing, which I, I did and, um, wanted that to be at the art exhibit. And then as I was like an hour away from finishing editing this video that I spent so much time on, like a computer just totally gave up being a computer. Um, so I had to scrap that whole idea. Um, so it's pictures today, but I think in a way, 
I had wanted to make the video and record my voice over it kind of as a way of hiding, honestly, if I really look at like what the motivation was there is that um, it's hard to talk about some of this stuff in front of a group of people. And I've, I've been fortunate to share my story a lot, but it always makes me kind of nervous to do. And by that happening, this was kind of a forced like, you know, I'm not going to hide behind it. I'm just going to show up and, and do it. Um, so I'm going to try to run through these because there, there is quite a bit um, so we can get to the good part at the end. So like I said, my name is Molly. I was born in Watauga County. I've lived here um, almost my entire life. Um, my, I was the oldest of three. Um, I have a younger brother and a younger sister and my parents. Um, I was born into a really privileged family. I didn't want for much as a child other than um, maybe to be understood or loved in a way that made more, more sense to me. Um, my parents got divorced when I was five. I don't really remember them ever arguing about that or talking about it. It was just one day that we weren't the family that we were the day before. Um, and I started to go back and forth between these very two different houses. Um, at my mom's house, I would wear um, smocked dresses and patent leather shoes, and I took the etiquette classes. And at my dad's, I was a total tomboy. I rode dirt bikes, and me and my brother shared clothes. And I got really good at becoming who I thought you wanted me to be. Um, whatever identity or persona that I needed to put on that I felt like would make me fit in. Um, my parents both remarried people that had um, children from their previous marriages. And then my dad um, and my stepmom had another daughter, Lily, who's 10 years younger than me. So I went from being like the oldest of this smaller family to being in the middle of seven children, um, which, was made it easy to blend in and to kind of go, um, kind of go un, unnoticed. Um, yeah. And Denise, you can stop me at any point if you want to. Um, so this this is a painting of a photo of me and my my father um, on the top of Grandfather Mountain in the '90s. Um, I had a lot of good memories. With my, with my dad and with my mom as a child, but it was kind of this like um, childlike wonder and awe and adventure and all of those things that you look back on, like coupled with a lot of confusion and a lot of isolation. My family wasn't really ever um, like to talk about things, um, didn't really share a lot of information and um, from as early as I can remember, I remember feeling like I have this like hole in the soul feeling like here is the world and everybody in it. And then I'm somewhere out here, um, a total apartness, a total inability to connect with um, other adults, with other children, um, constantly wondering if I'm good enough, if I'm measuring up. Um, so... I felt that way from, from some of my earliest, earliest memories. Um, it, when, I, when I got into high school, or actually I'll, I'll back up a little bit before that. Um, when I was like 10 or 11, um, I found like self-harm, um, self-harm as a way to kind of regain some control over my life, that it was kind of this um, private, um, release or this thing that I could do to change the way that I felt um, on the inside. And that worked really well for me um, until I discovered drugs and alcohol later when I was in, was in high school. Um, and it was uh, the first time I ever drank. It didn't make me feel beautiful or confident or any of those things. It just made it so that that voice in my head that was constantly telling me I'd never measure up just disappear. Like I felt like I could finally take a deep breath for the first time. I felt like I could finally connect with other people. Um, and I thought I had found the solution. It was like a spiritual experience that I had found this like missing piece, that hole in the soul feeling. And finally, 
um, finally been filled. So I just decided to do that as as often as I as I could. Did you say something, Denise? No, I did it. I've got a lot of feedback here, though. I'm sorry. You're okay. Um. So I can vividly remember being 14 and thinking, um, "There's no way that I'm going to make it um, to 18 years old." Um, the way that I that I feel the stuff that's going on at home. This is just absolutely um, intolerable. Um, and when I was about 15 is when I made my first real um, suicide attempt. Um, and I can remember going to bed that night. Um, I picked a day to do it. Um, and that night going to dinner with a perfect sense of peace and ease that I hadn't felt in years, that this was finally going to be over. Um, and I, I made the attempt and, you know, I had written a note and it was, it was unsuccessful and, um, woke up the next morning and nobody realized it. And I just went to school, like it was a normal day and, um, feeling so small and insignificant that I couldn't even kill myself. Um, so that was kind of how, how high school went, <laughs> went for me and, and then my whole world kind of changed um, in 2009. My father, um, who him and I at the time uh, didn't have a great relationship. I can honestly say at, the, at that time, I didn't have a great relationship with really any <clears throat> positive adult. Um, like I said, it was really hard for me to connect with other adults and feel like I could trust people. Um, to open up with what I was doing, with what was going on in my life, because I felt like if I'm honest about this thing, then they're going to try and stop me or they're going to take it away. And this is the one thing that I'm holding on to that makes my life somewhat bearable. Um, so in 2009, my dad passed away um, very suddenly. He had sleep apnea and didn't know that he had it. He also had diabetes and didn't know that he had it. So he wasn't um, taking care of his body the way that he should have. Um, and the sleep apnea had progressed to the point that he suffocated um, to death in his sleep. Um, and it was another one of those things that my family didn't really talk about. Um, we didn't grieve together. Um, we didn't even really talk about how he passed away. I found out how he died. Um, about a year later um, from an EMT that actually responded to the, to the scene. Um, and that was how I, how I found out how he had, had passed away. And I, um, the week after his funeral, I left my dad's house and never went, never went back there. Um, I've been back once and since I was an adult, but it was just when he died, um, it was like that whole half of my family also died in a lot of ways. Um, so that was my sophomore year. The summer after my sophomore year, I found out that I was pregnant, um, with my son. Um, so I dropped out of high school. Um, I went to Caldwell at night and got my high school equivalency. Um, I got married when I was 17 before he was born. Um, and that was like a decision that was made for me. Um, my family had basically said that if you're going to live with this person and have a baby with this person that you need to be married. Um, and so I, I just said, okay. And, and that's what we agreed to. And um, I believe at this point in my story, in my addiction, like I hadn't crossed that imaginary line in the sand uh, where my strongest like desire or willpower to stop like doesn't work. Um, at this point, I did have a, I hadn't crossed that line and I did have a really good reason to stop what I was doing. And that was my, my son. And so I was able to stop drinking and using um, for my pregnancy. I moved out, like I said, we got married and um, I was working full time and going to school at night. And on the outside, like everything looked really good. Like I had gotten um, all of these things that I had said for my whole childhood that I wanted, or that when I attained this or that, you know, that I would be free. Um, but it didn't take long after my son was born that I kind of started falling apart again, like that feeling of apartness, separateness, um, 
still unable to cope or connect with other people that that started to come back. Um, and I started drinking again. And my uh, husband and I separated um, soon after he was born. Um, and I moved out. This is a picture of um, the first apartment that I ever um, had by myself. And it was like the first time in my life that I could really drink or use the way that I wanted to um, behind closed doors. Uh, and I've heard people um, in recovery say that there's there's two types of addicts and alcoholics, that there's people who go out and dig a hole a little bit every day and it takes years to find a bottom. And then there's people who go out and find a mine shaft and just jump down into it. Um, and that was definitely my story. Um, it didn't take long at all before I was experiencing some uh, really dire consequences of my, of my addiction. Um, within like a year and a half, I had hardly any relationship with my son. Um, I felt like the best thing that I could possibly do was just not come around. Um, thankfully, I had family that um, loved him and uh, took care of him and protected him. Um, so I, I never had to worry about his, his safety in that way. Um, and I felt like the best thing I could do as a mom was to stay away, even though I loved him more than I'd ever loved anything. Um, I was no longer drinking at all for any type of fun or um, enjoyment. I was drinking to, to overcome that overwhelming obsession to capture that elusive feeling so that I can breathe um, and living really only only for that. I couldn't keep a job, um, couldn't pay my rent. Uh, here at the end, this is a picture of a trailer that I lived in um, on the top of Beach Mountain. It had no power, it had no running water. It was the middle of winter and this was in 2011 the winter of 2011. And it was when I was living here that I had this um, moment of clarity that I was um, 19 years old at the time, um, that I was so young and had the potential of so much life ahead of me. How on earth did it get this bad? And I was given a gift of desperation, I think, um, where I just wanted I wanted to live. I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to do things differently. Um, and so I went to someone that I trusted and really came clean about uh, how I had been living, what I had been doing, um, some of the trauma that I had been through as, as part of this story. Um, and I had burned that bridge. Um, you know, even though I, I came with a sincere desire, like because of my own actions and behaviors, you know, that that wasn't a a viable option anymore. And this person said, I didn't, they didn't want much to do with me, but maybe this other person would help. And somebody helped me move out, move my stuff out of this trailer um, into a storage unit uh, with the, I had the full intention of living in that storage unit um, for the rest of the winter until I could get my life back together. Um, and I think they could tell that. And so they offered to let me stay with them and that started off like maybe the two worst weeks of my life um, where I have a picture of just my black hole. I didn't really know what to say about this part um, where I was sexually assaulted um, by someone that I had really um, was really close to and had really trusted prior to that. Um, and I didn't have any of the words um, to describe what was happening. I had no idea where to go or who to, to tell. I thought it, I didn't know what um, threats or coercion were at that point at all. Um, just that this, this is all my fault, that I'm dirty, um, worthless, you know, all of this negative, you know, self, self-talk and um, looking back on it now, I can see like that what I was experiencing was like that immediate PTSD after that event. But at the time, I just thought I was really losing it, um, going into a store and um, almost all of the men that I saw, I could find his face um, 
in those people's faces, hearing a voice on the other side of a grocery aisle and it's his voice. Um, it was a very scary, um, scary time period. Um, and so trying to think, I ran away, I left that situation. And I think this person was afraid that I would tell somebody or um, that they, they would be found out. And so they went to one of my family members and said, uh, she's out of control. I've done everything that I can do to help her. I think she's using drugs, you need to help her. And that was the first time that anybody in my family says that they knew that I had an addiction problem or said that they knew um, what, was, what was going on. Um, so out of that experience, I got to go to treatment for the first time. Um, I've been fortunate enough that um, you know, there were some financial resources made available for me to go to treatment and I went down to South Florida. Um, kind of having no idea what it was that I was doing, but just going through the motions. Um, and that was the first time that I had ever been um, to a 12 step meeting before. And I walked in and it was a speaker meeting and the person speaking was a, a much older black man. And on paper, we had nothing in common, um, but he told my story word for word, just, just about, um, maybe not in his lived experience, but in the way that he felt um, in that uh, apartness, that hole in the soul, always trying to fill it with something and um, failing miserably, um, making the same irrational choices while drinking or using, prioritizing drugs or alcohol over, over anything else that I can always talk myself back into, well, this will be different this time. I won't do that again, but then I put a drink or a drug in my body and I'm off to the races and nothing can stop me. Um, and prior to that, I thought that I was just chronically different from other people. I knew that I drank too much. I knew that probably most normal people didn't use the drugs that I was, was using, but I didn't really think that I was an addict or an alcoholic. I thought I was just really like mentally, physically, spiritually, separate and different from other people. Um, and it was the first time that I felt like somebody else could understand me, or here was a group of people who were just like me and had been where I had been. Um, and they were actually happy and they were living life successfully. Um, and I really wanted that. Um, but that disease like crept back in and I made up an excuse to say, you know, forget this. And I, I went home and relapsed and uh, another horrible period, but um, I, a seed had been planted in me and I knew that where I had been was where I needed to go back. And so I drove back down to South Florida um, to go to Halfway, showed up at the Halfway house, had been up for way too long and they took a look at me and were like, you're taking a drug test. <laughs> I couldn't pass it, um, failed it. So they said, you can't stay here. And I had been living out of my car for a lot out of over the last couple months. And so I said, well, what's one more night? And so I'm driving around trying to find somewhere to park. And I think a combination of the trauma that I had experienced recently and, um, the effects of the drugs that I had been using and staying up for so long and not taking care of my body um, that I was hearing um, like auditory stuff going on, uh, things crashing around me, people following me um, and was just terrified and convinced that I was about to be killed, that somebody was about to attack me and I was gonna die. And so after hours of this, I eventually called the police and they showed up and, you know, could tell immediately, you know, what was really going on. And I had drugs in the car and um, got arrested for a, a felony, for two felonies. Um, and I had never been in that type of trouble before. Um, but I'm incredibly grateful for it today because I, I don't think without that abrupt, like, interruption in my life, I don't think I would have gotten sober when I when I did. Um, and I've been sober since that day. And that was um, January 19th. So my sobriety date is January 20th, 2012. 
Um, I spent my first few days of sobriety in jail. I was so embarrassed um, about what had happened and who I had become. I didn't call anyone. I didn't um, do anything, but they eventually um, released me. And I went back to treatment um, for a few days until my insurance dropped me. And then I was just kind of out, um, out on my own. But I had made a lot of really good friends where I went to to treatment. And because of the arrests that I had, um, when I went and spoke with my attorney, he said, you know, if you get convicted of this, um, the, the max penalty is four years. And so that fear sobered me for a bit. I think it, it, the fear of consequences kept me sober just barely <laughs> long enough to do, to put some real work into my, um, into my recovery. Um, and so I got into drug treatment court was actually how that played out. Um, so I'm doing drug court, I'm going to court, I'm trying to keep up with my stuff for that. Um, I went to a ton of meetings, you know, in the first 90 days, but I wasn't really working a program yet. And, uh, I found, I, I know today that I use drugs and alcohol because of the way that I feel when I'm absolutely sober. So just taking the drugs and alcohol away doesn't really solve anything. Um, for me, it actually makes it worse because now I'm dealing with all these feelings, all of this huge wreckage of my past, um, just un, unedited. Um, and I'm feeling all of that. And so I know I'm a piece of crap when I'm drinking or, and using, or that's how I feel. And now I feel like a piece of crap sober. So what's the point? I can't do this anymore. Um, and I was probably more at risk for, for harming myself with beyond repair at that point at 60 or 90 days sober that I had ever been while drinking. And at that point, um, today, what I choose to call God did something that I, for me that I couldn't do for myself. And he put another woman in recovery in my, in my path. And I shared at a meeting, something really toxic and emotional. And she came like striding up to me afterwards. She was blonde and beautiful and confident and seemed to embody all these things that I was incapable of being. Um, and she said, my name's Lindsay and I'm going to be your sponsor. And it wasn't a question. And she said, are you willing to go to any lengths for your sobriety? And I kind of mumbled out a yes, but on the inside, I was um, absolutely screaming um, for her to help me. And so we worked through the literature of that program, um, working steps as we went and, you know, little by slowly, all of these promises, um, all these spiritual principles, things that once felt so unattainable to me um, started to come true in my life. Um, that I, I did the suggestions of people who had, had been around longer than me. I got really connected with people, um, looked for opportunities to be of service uh, wherever I could. And like I said, little by slowly, life just started to happen in a way that worked. Um, I, believe that it is possible to recover from addiction and alcoholism. Um, that doesn't mean that if I go out and pick up a drink or a drug later today, um, that I'm not going to be right back where I was 10 years ago. It means that I'm no longer at the absolute mercy of a disease that tells me the only solution to life and the only solution to the way that I feel is to drink and drug myself to death. Um, and that obsession has not returned. Um, and it won't as long as I continue to take care of myself. Um, so it took me about a year and a half to get through the drug court program. Uh, this was in Palm Beach County, Florida. Um, so really different and lacking, um, which I know it's kind of lacking everywhere, um, but just a massive public mental health system uh, that was really difficult to navigate. Um, I lost my car as a consequence of my addiction. So I was walking to work, walking everywhere. You had to call every day for your color. And uh, if it was your color, you had to go get drug tested. And there was one drug testing site in this massive county. It's 45 minutes away, I have no transportation. Um, and if I couldn't find somebody else you know, in the program to take me, then I just, you had to miss it. I didn't have an option. 
Um, and so that happened a few times and they count those as positive. So there were times where I had a, a year sober working in treatment, going and serving uh, jail sanctions um, on the weekend. But I just used those as opportunities to find, you know, undoubtedly there's somebody in there that I can be helpful to or just to be supportive, um, be supportive to. And that's just how I looked at it and, and got through it. Um, what am I looking at here? Okay. So at about a year and a half sober, when I was allowed to leave for leave drug court, um, I started to really feel called um, to go back home. I think it was absolutely necessary for me to go, go away, to have a break from the chaos that was my life in order to get better for myself, but it was necessary for me to come back and clean up the wreckage of my past. Um, and that was terrifying to me to move back here. Um, I felt like I had nobody and nothing but bad memories here. Um, but I knew I wanted to be a, a mom to my son. I knew that, that if it hadn't have been for him that I wouldn't have gotten sober. And so one morning I'm sitting on the porch of one of my friend's house saying, you know, all of the reasons why this won't work out, all of the reasons why this is surely going to end in my, in my demise. And, uh, he just looked at me and said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Um, and that just stopped me in my tracks and continues to stick with me today when I'm facing some type of um, indecision that what would you do if you weren't afraid? Um, and so I packed a U-Haul and I went home and I just kept doing the things that worked for me down there up, up here. There definitely weren't as many resources up here as there were in Florida. Um, but continued to look for opportunities to be of service, continued to engage with 12-step programs. Um, and then Tanner. <laughs> so my son, Tanner, um, he's 11 now. Um, and when I, when I came back, I hadn't been a huge part of Tanner's life. And he you know, I would go to pick him up from school and he would say thing or daycare and he would say like, how much longer do I have to stay with you? When can I go back, you know, to this place or to that place? Um, and that absolutely broke my heart because I wanted to be Tanner's mom and I wanted him to love me more than I wanted anything else in the world. But I couldn't be angry with him for that, that I caused that feeling in him with my own absence and lack of care and attention and I couldn't apologize for it in a way that would make sense I couldn't explain it to him in a way that makes sense he was three at the time and so all I had was my actions and so I just continued to show up for him day after day and let him you know work through what he needed to do in order to trust me again and we became best friends um, I got full custody of Tanner about a year after I moved home and, you know, I've spent every day of my adult life as a parent and have done a lot of growing up uh, with Tanner. And so I like to say he's like my little pilot fish that's just orbited around me um, and stuck with me through, through so much. What's next here? What time is it? 1234. Okay. Um, We're doing Okay. Um, let me say one thing here since you're taking a breath, and that is when you were talking, one of the things when we were talking about this, um, you and I both, I can't remember which one of us said it, I think you said it, and it so resonated with me that every day when you, and I, I don't know if this is just true for people with trauma, it seems like that every day when you create a positive life, I have felt, and what you said was wreckage is one decision away. And so that feeling of if I don't make the right choices today, or if I choose a certain thing, that this will all be gone, you know, and I'll be back in the depths of, um, you know, whatever trauma and despair. And so I don't know that it looks like to me sometimes that when I look at other people, who maybe don't come from trauma or addiction, that that is not something that they speak of feeling, you know, that it's, it seems to be easier somehow or not so scary, but just that 
I think it is common for people that have a high trauma background, just the, the knowledge that one misstep or the belief that one misstep is going to recreate all the things that we try to, to get away from and rebuild. So I just wanted to bring that back up. Yeah, absolutely. And that idea that like anything that I put before my recovery that I'm going to lose, you know, even if those are really important things like my family or like my job, you know, um, obviously try to show up for my family in every imaginable way, but I can't let those responsibilities become more important than my own, like, maintenance, <laughs> you know, or else I'm not going to be able to do those things anymore. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. You can go ahead. Um, so when I, before I had moved back home, I went and made amends to a, a therapist that I had had when I was in Florida and asked, um, how, how can I make this right? You know, what can I do to make it, to fix it? And he said to stay sober and to go back to school specifically for social work. And so I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do that. And I did. And so I applied to ASU as a non-degree seeking student. Um, I had done really bad in high school. Um, when I finished my high school equivalency, I walked out of there with the full intention of never stepping foot in another classroom again. And so walked into ASU, I had never relied on a computer. Uh, everyone there was like, or it seemed like, you know, was fresh out of something right before. And I really struggled to, to find my footing there and to keep up with everyone. But I, and being non-degree seeking, I didn't have academic advising. So I'm kind of taking things at random and just trying to figure it out. And a couple of adjunct professors helped like guide me, uh, through that process, but I, I found that when I really wanted to, to do something and had a, like a, a clear head that I was capable of doing all kinds of things that I thought was impossible before. And school was one of those things. I found that I not only enjoyed school, but that I really excelled at it. Um, after about two years, I applied as a degree seeking student at ASU and was turned down because I had a high school equivalency. They said I didn't have enough. I had a 4.0 at ASU, but I didn't have enough basic education requirements to apply to any university in North Carolina. So I had to go back and get my associate's degree, um, which was a humbling experience and probably exactly what I needed. And then I came back to ASU and entered the social work program. And it was kind of a similar feeling as coming into 12-step recovery for me. It was like, I found this group of people that are just like me that I didn't know even existed. Um, those value, social work values of service and the importance of the dignity and worth of all people and human relationships, that those were all things that I had already tried to, to live my life by. And here's another group of people who are already doing this. And it was like a coming home feeling again. And I had, uh, originally thought I wanted to be a substance abuse counselor. Um, but in that program there, I kind of got interested in corrections issues and realized that, you know, these were people who funnel in and out of the justice system are really, I thought, the most vulnerable among us. That these are these people are often in the, in the highest degree of need. They are the easiest to blame for their circumstances and receive uh, the least amount of resources. And I just jumped like headfirst into that topic. And I knew that th this is what I wanted to do. And at the time it didn't seem like uh, many other people, people were doing that. Um, and so when I got to the end of the program and to do my internship, I applied at a state agency and it, it wasn't what I thought I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be like a clinical prison social worker. Uh, and there aren't many prisons around here. So I applied to another state like justice agency. Um, and again, was turned down. Um, even, again, even though I had done really well, that 
I had this criminal history, even though I had completed drug court, I'm not a felon, I wasn't convicted, it still shows up on a, on a background check. And it wasn't the office here decision that was like a state policy. And I felt like I have worked years, you know, I had, I think I was sober about six years at the time, um, really threw my whole life into this and that this is just always going to be a barrier for me. Like, I'm always going to check that box. Nobody's going to give me a chance, you know, all, all of that type of thinking. And I went to a group's class the night after I'd been turned down and kind of shared that with the group. And a woman came up to me afterwards with her phone in her face. And she said, uh, my dad is Kelly Redman. He's the captain. He's now the major, but at the time he's the captain at the sheriff's office over the jail and he wants you to call him. Um, so I went and met with Kelly that following week and just, you know, laid out my, you know, I was really nervous to walk into that, uh, that environment. It wasn't, you know, be, because of my history and my own, like, false beliefs that I had created about law enforcement and, you know, just a lot of fear and a partness type thing again. Um, that was really nerve wracking for me to walk into. And I can say with without a shadow of a doubt that from day one, the sheriff's office absolutely um, have supported me, welcomed me, included me, encouraged me in every um, imaginable way. A lot of the people there have become like family to me. Um, some of them I talk to more than my own family today, um, which kind of makes what has happened for me so, so heartbreaking to see what they're going through right now from a distance. And they were all like, we're fixers and there's no real fixing. Um, so Ashley, Ashley's on here. We've just continued to try to just show up um, and, and spend time with those people over there. Um, but so Kelly and, and Lynn, the sheriff really just brought me in under like, we recognize that there are people in the jail who shouldn't be there, who continue to come in and out. They have um, mental health issues, they have substance issues and we're law enforcement. Like we don't really know what to do with this or how to fix this. Um, to just do something, you know, with that topic. And they just, I mean, they, they knew my background and they trusted me um, to make the right decisions and to just intervene in some way. And so the first thing I did, um, I kind of knew what, what was happening, um, but wanted to be able to prove it. Um, wanted to be able to say on paper, like that this is a reality. You know, the, these are the stories of people who cycle in and out of jail. Um, so I did a big research study. I interviewed 50 habitual or chronic offenders. So they've been arrested three or more times in Watauga County um, to look at the biggest causes of recidivism in Watauga County. And overwhelmingly the four big ones were childhood trauma, um, housing insecurity, mental illness, and substance use. And then with all those people that I interviewed, I tried to do like some basic um, resource coordination or connecting with services. And that's really where the recovery on the inside or the, the jail program started. Um, and since then through that program and the, the LEAD program, which essentially works with the same population of people just outside of jail, um, we've been able to help or work with hundreds of people. Um, and not that I think I'm so great or that we're, you know, whatever, but we've we've secured over a million dollars in grant funding, you know, for those programs. And just a lot of really powerful things have come out of that work that wouldn't have happened if one person, uh, Kelly Redman, hadn't given me a shot or an opportunity. Um, and I'm eternally grateful um, for that, uh, not only for what they've done for this community, but what they've done for me personally. Um, like I said, being trusted, being involved, being included, um, being made to feel like family there has been a huge, huge part of my, my story and my recovery. Um, 
so in the midst of all of that stuff with school and with the jail, um, I had two more children. Uh, Meadow is almost two and Sawyer is almost one. And uh, life has not been easy. We've been dealt a lot of cards that I wouldn't have, have anticipated. Um, I got married and separated again, and that was really sad for, for all of us. But you know, if, if that hadn't have happened, I don't think where I would be where I was today, where uh, my partner and I together, we have six children. Um, and they're the light of my world. They're or Tom's kids. Their mom is an addict and an alcoholic and hasn't been um, a part of their lives in some time. And um, I still do a lot of like online meetings now um, during the pandemic and his kids are all very interested in that. And sometimes they'll stand behind me and just uh, just look and listen. And a few weeks ago, I had this experience where I just like realized that I get to stand in the gap of where their mom was. Um, not that I'm taking her place or that I'll ever be their, their mom, but I have this opportunity to show up for them and be like a sober, responsible, healthy woman in their lives uh, where their mom's not able, able to be. And that's because I'm sober today um, and because of my recovery and what an awesome responsibility um, that that has been. I'm not sure what else to say, Denise. <laughs> I have a very <laughs> full life, <laughs> very full. <laughs> Thank you, Molly, for sharing all that with us. I, as I hear you telling these things, and this has happened to me before when listening to other people's stories, what hits me is the amount of destruction that we can do to a person is astonishing, but so is the resiliency of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really appreciate you sharing all that. And one of the things that we've talked about with these Thriving Live series is that it's so important not just to talk about the trauma, but the healing and the growth and, you know, just having someone to believe in you. And I, you and I didn't say to you, identify a person who was your, your champion that believed in you probably before you even believed in yourself. But I hear that in your voice when you talk about Kelly. Mm -hmm. And so he just really, <laughs> um, and he'll talk about about it some now like when I when I came in I was very unsure of myself and he always he he would kind of fuss at me he'd say like quit looking in the rear view you know your life is is up here you know in front of you quit looking back there you know um so Kelly is has been a huge huge part of my story and Ashley um you know I've had a couple people that you know regardless of what has happened uh, have been consistent and have stayed there and there have been times where I've where I've leaned on Ashley probably to the point of almost breaking her but if she hadn't let me do that um I wouldn't I wouldn't be here so um somebody wrote something in the chat one second let me read this okay thank you for sharing your story um, I'll send you this whole long comment um, okay. about displaying your work. It is beautiful. I was so impressed by your illustrations and um, think you should write a children's book or something. Mm. So we'll talk about that another day, but um, extremely powerful. So if you want to say something to Molly in the chat, I'm going to copy and paste all the chats for her. So if you don't have a question, but just want to say something, I'll, I'll send her those when this is done. Um, one thing, Molly, when we were talking that day, um, I've heard people talk about maybe envisioning their trauma, giving it a, a shape or identity that somehow makes it easier to either understand it or speak to the parts of us that were young when that happened. And when you and I were talking that day, somehow for the first time I had this vision of if trauma was a person it would be an expert at doing all those things that abusive partners do about gaslighting and keeping us isolated and making us feel alone and every single person that I've done these with 
that is the running theme of, I thought I was the only one. I didn't have anybody to turn to. I was so isolated and alone. And I felt that too. And, you know, just understanding that it's an entity that has that kind of power and um, that it's so important to somehow be able to connect with people who live in trauma to help them know that they're not alone and that they're not crazy or bad. And so that was something that as we were wrapping up the other day, that visual came to me for the first time and really helped me understand how it is that somebody can feel so alone when they're in a room full of people. Right. Um, it's just that thing that happens to us. Yeah. And I think, you know, that I know for me, like that feeling, that was very true. Like that was my whole world. That really is how I felt, but it might not, it wasn't always, you know, the reality you know, there probably were people, I mean, Denise, uh, self-disclosed, Denise was my school social worker, you know, like during this time where I was, it was incredibly um, chaotic. And I know Denise would have helped me. I know she would have done anything for me um, if I had come to her, if I had come to her at attention. And that was probably true for other people as well, but that we don't know what people are going through. Um, I don't think that I set off a lot of alarms for other people because my family was very wealthy, that we were very privileged, that I, you know, I did have nice clothes. I, you know, I didn't fit, I didn't check the boxes of things to look out for, but on the inside, you know, I'm absolutely falling apart. Um, and so today, kind of going off like what you were talking about, like that feeling of apartness and unable to connect with other people or unsure of where to turn like I see part of my role in service is to not wait for people to ask me for help um you know to try and that's why I love what Ashley and I do so much is that we get to show up and work with people who otherwise would have gone unnoticed um, or that other people don't want to work with or that have been written off over and over and over again. And even if they're not ready to stop using or stop drinking, like that doesn't care how important you are as a human being and that we care about you and what happens to you is important. Um, and so if you're, if you're not ready to take steps towards recovery, you know, then for us, it just becomes about like creating that caring, positive, consistent relationship with people so that when they are ready to take steps towards recovery, that they know somebody cares about them and is willing to pull out all the stops to get them the help that they need. Um, more times than once, we've been somebody's only emergency contact. Uh, we had last year um, a client that we ended up being responsible for their cremation, that they had no family, um, that we navigated the unclaimed body process. I mean, and I went to, to pick up his ashes um, from Austin and Barnes and drive them, you know, back, back here. And uh, I had this moment of where I looked over in the car seat and he's sitting there. And all I could think was that I wanted you in that seat in another way, but it didn't happen. You know, I wanted to take this person um, somewhere safe and it didn't happen. And that, that's the why, that's why we work with difficult people. That's why we show up because we never know how, how important or how much we're needed. Um, and that type of thing has happened over and over. Honestly. When you're when you're talking about not waiting for others to ask for help, when we were working on the art exhibit, and I was trying to think of what I wanted to do, and about that time, I had asked somebody to help me with something, and they showed up, and I didn't think twice about it, and somebody took a picture of it and sent it to me later, and when I was looking at it, I was like struck by the fact that I'm 52, and that's really one of the first times I could remember asking somebody for help. And, they, and, that, and I didn't even think twice about it. Normally it's this long elaborate thing of, do I really need help? Who am I gonna ask? They're not gonna come through. What if they don't show up? It's just torture. It's just mm -hmm. so much easier not to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And when I was thinking about what I wanted to do for the art project and some of my trauma experiences, I remember clearly 
that when I was young, it wasn't a matter of not asking for help. It was that that's not an option for you because help is not available. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, growing up, it's a belief, it's a conviction that there's no point in even needing help because it's not coming. And right. so when you grow up like that, mm -hmm. you know, people are so good about saying, reach out if you need something. And I do that too. But if you don't know how to ask for help, if it's never been available, if it's never been an option, if you don't know how to do it, right. one of the, in the conference, somebody said, you know, everybody says, if you need something, my door is always open. But what if you don't know how to get to the door? Mm -hmm. Like there, there's steps that happen before the walking in of the door to ask for the help. Right. When, and so, uh, when you've grown up with like this really ingrained belief system that the only person that I can rely on is myself, that's really hard, hard to get out of. Even if you can, you know, mentally, you know, say like, I know this person would do something for me. You know, it still gets filtered and sucked through this screen of over and over and over again, like, the only person that I could rely on to make this better was myself. So I'm going to ask you, you know, as, you, as we leave, what's the one thing that you would want people who are working with people from trauma to know? But I think one of the things that I would say is not to ask people if they need help, but to say, what can I assume that they do? What can I do for you? And then if they tell you nothing, then that's a whole different thing to deal with. But the whole, you know, let me know if you need help. That's just not very effective when you are from a life where that's never been an option for you. So that's one of my things. But if you could say one thing about, you know, how, how to help someone, like you said, you never, nobody knew by looking at you and you never reached out and tried to get what you needed. And so is there some insight you can provide to people as we're leaving about how to reach people who are struggling and alone? Mm. I guess I just want to piggyback on what you said, like, especially in like this time of like community trauma that we're going through, like, don't wait for people to ask for help. And if it is, it's overwhelming uh, to be asked, like, what do you need when you're in like that fight or flight? Like, I'm not capable of making, I have no idea what I need, you know, but, you know, I'm going to take all this on myself and get it done because that's the only way that I know how to do something. And I think that's true for a lot of people with trauma backgrounds or like I said right now and what we're going through is to if someone says, you know, nothing or, you know, find something anyways, even if it's something small, you know, it could be like just a, a text reminder just saying, hey, I care about you, you're important or, you know, whatever or just yeah, don't, don't wait. I think we can always find, you know, small ways to show up and be of service. Well, I so appreciate your um, being willing to share so much of your story um, and all the things that kind of brought you to where you are. And so we're going to get ready to wrap up. There's been a lot of comments in the chat that I'll send you. If you have anything you'd like to add before we go, you've got a few more seconds to do that. Um, thank you, Molly. I know you, you mentioned to me that you haven't done anything in an audience quite like this. So I appreciate you being brave. Um, yeah. it's, it's an inspiration to us. So thank you for that. Well, thanks for giving me the platform to do it. So, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Um, everybody, I hope the rest of your week goes well. And, um, one more quick housekeeping thing is that um, I want y'all's help in finding future people for us to talk with and listen to. So um, I've sent around a one question survey should take you 30 seconds. And so if you can um, send me any ideas to help me with that, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'll let you go do something before your next meeting starts and hope the rest of your day goes well. Thank you, Molly. Thank you.